Okay, we're now. Oh, it's here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Five thirty. Now you're going to imagine that you are now going to do what is being required, right? So start at the beginning of that sentence. For someone who is trained, experienced in some degree in geometry upon seeing these figures would be led to think on the one hand David, would you pick it up from there? And Where are we? Would be led to think on the one hand About 529C E Oh, oh. 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 okay One, two, or three A little bit C E, two lines mm. One down or <clears throat> Would be led to think on the one hand the resulting workmanship to be most beautiful. Yet they think it would be, yet they would certainly think it ridiculous to take these things seriously as if they were to grasp the truth in cells about equal or double or any other symmetrical proportion. Yeah, that's easy to do. Right? I mean, it doesn't create any problem, does it? Uh, isn't he dismissing, isn't he dismissing the assumption that these beautiful Didelian um, uh, figures are in any way a match for what is true in terms of the, 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 the out the, the beings of ethos. I mean, of equal and double. Like, in all these cases, we're being asked to separate these notions from, from their physical representation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I notice you ignore in cells in your statement. Um, yes, because I don't know if it's the selves that we've been talking about in the Parmenides as these ideas um. are in cells as we talk about individual, I mean, about the idea of self. Yeah, if we just stay, though, in the Republic, could you unpack okay. that? Or is that a serious problem or a serious way of talking? Or if they were to grasp the truth in self about equal or double or any other symmetrical proportion. Well, I know how to solve this. <laughs> uh, Julie has a self, and we can ask her. <laughs> and in self, in yourself, can you tell us about the double... And the equal. I can tell you equal. In the self. Uh, in myself, but I can't communicate it to you other than hope, hope that you have that. Well, everyone else that would know how to do it. <laughs> well, it, it you know, re requires some practice in separating these notions from the visible world. That's true. Right. And then to see those ideas as a manifestation of self and being <laughs> illuminated by this spangled Same. luminosity of no wait, not even illuminated by that oh. illuminated by the brilliant light of being what do you do now with the uh, equal and double I think those are the um, not this equal and double but the idea of equal and double Oh, and you discover that in oneself. Apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's, that's the mystery, how you do that. Yeah, that would be pretty easy for everybody. Yeah, keep reading from that point on. That's fabulous. Glaucon says, How then could it not be ridiculous to expect, uh, to expect it to be the case? Socrates says, Surely you do not think that one who is truly an astronomer is affected in the same way when they look up the movements of the stars. That self, on the one hand, will take into account 
that heaven and all in self are established in this way by the demiurgos, in this most beautiful way possible, for such works to be established. But on the one hand, would self not consider absurd those who customarily imagine that this symmetry between night to day are both these to month and also month to year and other heavenly bodies both to themselves and towards one another and I'll probably wait for the end of the sentence and uh, ex excuse me existed and they also existed in the same way without undergoing any change though they have a body and are visible and to search by every way to grasp the truth about selves. Themselves. Themselves? Well, it's not the reflexive. Yeah, because the study then, would you agree, will take into account that heaven and all in self. Uh, that's astronomy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. That's what he's calling astronomy. That's what he's calling astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look here. You're going to take into account all that heaven or being and all in the self. Is that right? What would you be doing? Come on now. What would Here's a quote. There's the object of study. Can you ask that question again, please? Yeah. <laughs> I'll do better than that. I'll read it and then ask it this way. All right. Now he's characterizing this study as different than what astronomers are doing. And he starts the sentence with that self on the one hand, will take into account, what will take into account? The self. Will take into account that heaven and all in self are established in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? Would you agree? There are two uses of the word heaven mm -hmm. in this. One is as a metaphor for Reality, ultimate reality, and the other is the everyday vision of heavens being heavens, the sun and the stars and the planets. Uh, which way is he using those two terms, uh, those two ideas of heaven? <coughs> that self will take into account that heaven and all in self. He's using it in the higher sense. The higher? Yeah. Oh, what would you be doing? I don't know. Okay, just ask your neighbor. You don't need to know. Yeah. Just sit next to someone who looks intelligent. <laughs> um, well, it's like that self is um, the instrument by which uh, it takes in everything in the heavens and all in self, including itself. Mm. That's pretty powerful. Yes, it is. Yes, go ahead. Perhaps takes in nothing in the heavens, but uses that as a way to image the notions that he wants to contemplate in himself. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's a metaphor. And then the heaven is used as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. So do that again. I didn't understand. Mm that these, these proportions and relationships that he sees and the way the cycles of astronomy work are not to be taken literally, but only as models for examining proportions and relationships within the self. Oh, okay. That's right. Thank you. Couldn't remember what I said before, so I Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was better. Yeah, it was better. Good. <laughs> 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 they're not separate. 
Who uses the word heaven? Mm -hmm. right. this, is, this is taking the word heaven metaphorically. Therefore, there must be a number of things parallel to this. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then, uh, that self will take into account. Right? So, therefore, we just need just one thing to help out. So self will take an account, right? Uh, the self will take into account that heaven and all, right? And self. So self will take into account heaven and all, Himself. Right. Let's take it metaphorically. By parallel, he then talks about then the study of these heavenly objects, you have to take them in themselves and in relation to one another. And if that's the case, parallel, you would also have to then do the same thing by showing the relation between these in the same way, relation between them and among themselves. Right, I'm using the words in the text, doing a parallel structure for it. Now, these, these always, he says, exist in the same way, exist in the same unalterable way. While these uh, may change or do change, So this is the changing heaven, and this is the unchanging.
Now, let's finally get the real understanding of music and harmony, shall we? Now, I'm picking that up at 530-D-3. Socrates says, Then I said, Besides this study, there exists the counterpart of self. Hey, curious language, isn't it? Right? It's a counterpart of self, so it, that's just what you did there, right? Two ways of looking at it. Well, let's get that. So please, I invite you to take a few minutes out and do some reading. Just a paragraph or two, that's all you need. Socrates down from the sec, not right at 530D, but like 530D3. Besides this study, there exists the counterpart of self. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Here's 530D, and then here's the thing, okay? Now, you're going to recognize, obviously, that this is music, so... <laughs> Okay, what's your task? To try to find out what is this study? Would you agree we're going to be using exactly the same kind of thinking? <clears throat> mm -hmm. He's going to say, 
whatever study it is, the popular study is rejected for the more profound and higher. Therefore, you want to make a note of what is the lesser or the popular. And then for the higher and more profound, and you want to contrast them. And when you do that, of course, you'll see something quite different. Because this is what he's going to call music, not this. So, So on the lesser, he's going to treat it as lesser and superficial. And he does that. I have a couple of quotes you can pick up. He doesn't say much about it other than uh, it's, it's a useful search if it's for the beautiful and good, but the way it's pursued is to argue over intervals and making life miserable for cat cat and, and okay. beatings and expostulations of the strings and the measuring of notes and in between notes. The measuring of notes in between notes and trying, but if you don't take it to the level of number, Ah. You have to take it to the next level of number. Let's take a look at that. Mm-hmm. What, he sees, what does he say about number? Because that's the level he's going to be on. Let's see. Okay, it says, uh, For they search for num... Oh, wait a second. For those who do the same things in music as the others did in astronomy, and here he's talking about the higher level. Yes. For they search for numbers in these symphonies which are heard. Wait. Okay, well, he's not talking. About, but they do not rise up to problems. You have to rise up to pro- to inquire what numbers, what numbers are symphonic, and which numbers are not, and the reason why they are the one and not the other. Okay. And it's useful if they five thirty one e five thirty one c c. You need to say where you guys are before you... 531C, Gina. Good. All right. Thank you, you David. Mm-hmm. Could you do it again, please? They do not rise up to the level of what? So, uh, problems. The lower hey. do not rise to the level of problems, which means okay. the other ones have to rise to the level of problems. Good. That's us. Good. And to inquire what numbers are symphonic, whatever that means. All right. Sound together. That's a good Thought I'd help you with that. Okay. So, proportionate and equal. Are we going to say that? Does that mean like concordant or? Different from searching for numbers on the tones and in between tones. And, and ultimately, this one leads to the good and the beautiful. Yeah, but you must also make sure you know the reason why. Some yeah. are and some are not. What he calls symphonic. Huh? Yes, please. So we have the people who argue about the tones and the tones between the tones, which is one kind of playing of music. The other is a symphonic, which is a, a like a, a number, definite number. Symphonic being played together, see. complete two different ways of looking at music. Yeah, let's see. <coughs> Is he looking at n- musical notes? No. Or is he looking at the nature of number? <coughs> or, 
Or is he considering music can be represented by numbers? Yeah. And he's looking for problems in that. Which is the case? He's looking for the problems in the nature of numbers. He's looking at the nature of numbers. Yes. But, so we can go back and bring in all we've said about numbers at this point. That's right. The nature of... Now we can go back now to astronomy, remember? Yeah. Equal and double. Hmm. Remember, we spent yeah. some time on that. <coughs> it's similar, isn't it? It's a curious way of talking about number. And look here. It presupposes that you're going to run into problems. <laughs> By the way, does he mention what kind of problems? No. Uh, does he tell you how you can look to find out whether some numbers are symphonic and which are not and why? No. Not there. Therefore, it's very usable as a model. Is that right? I would think you'd have to know something about what symphonic means. That's right. And he doesn't tell us, does he? No, no. Right. Well, there are all kinds of riddles throughout these studies. Now we have one more. Actually, we have two more. All right. And now we're going into the dialectic. Now I made some uh, copies on the dialectic for those that may not have one on um, the Balboa translation. Who doesn't have it? I know this broad. I mean, I know this would have worked. Oh, well armed. There are two in here. Uh, let me see if I can separate them. Uh, Any others? Okay. Now this is a challenge. This is a good challenge. So take a moment out. What numbers is he, is he at? This yes, what number? I think he's back to 530. Pierre, what number are you at with the dialectic or are you? Yes. What number? what number? dialectic. What number? Well, actually, it's 531. Uh, the introduction to dialectic starts at 531D. That is necessary now to take all of these studies and you have to show their kinship and community with one another. And... Uh, and... Uh, infer by the logos what's akin to one another. 
Now, this kind of pursuit is going to bring us finally to that which we want after our great labor. Therefore, he's now introducing the pasture of the soul. That's the dialectic. And the people who are going to be able to do this are those who are able to receive the logos. Therefore, he starts it at 5.32. Is it not the case, O Glaucon, that this is the pasture of the, the self-pasturage, the self-pasturage, the pasturage of the self? Right? And all of those other studies are just preludes to the dialectic. Now, if you're reading this carefully, you should say to yourself, uh, yeah. yeah, it's called the pasturage of the soul. Uh, you're supposed to see the kinship and community among them and between them. But I don't understand other than the arithmetic, exactly what to do in each one of those studies. Well, they talk about numbers and finding out which ones are symphonic and which are not without telling us anything about what makes them symphonic and what does not, and what, what is he talking about, equal selves or in the self. Yeah, you follow all of that. Uh, now you have to bring them all together and see their kinship. How can you do that if you don't know what he's talking about? Well, just to put that aside, that's only a minor point. Okay. Right. Now we're in the dialectic. If you thought we were having difficulties before, watch this come up.
Okay. Who needs more time? Oh, a couple of lifetimes. Okay. A couple of lifetimes. Okay. <laughs> That's in the same way. You got it? About five lines down or so. Uh, 532A5 or 6. Thus, in the same way, when anyone attempts to use dialectic by the Logos, without any use of the senses, they are impelled to that which each self is, exists. And if they do not give up until they grasp and comprehend the self-good by self-intellect, then self arrives at the end of the intelligible, just as it does at the end of the visible. The end of the visible is the sun. So therefore, he's going back to this image. Thank you. It's a head, parallel structure. He let you work it out. We did it before. All right? Now look, take a look at it. What do you need? The Logos. Right? With that, you're going to be impelled to that which each self exists. Right? And to the nature of each self that exists. And you're not going to give up until you grasp the self-good, the self-intellect. Then, the self arrives at the end. Then. Notice, it's a beautiful description of dialectic. It looks like the ascent to the upper world. Yeah. From the cave. Yeah, now look, but just take the structure, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to use the logos. And that's going to impel you to discover what each self is. Look here. See? These are all cells. So you're going to use the logos. Right, use the logos. Right? That's what you're going to do. You're going to impel it, right? What are you going to do? See, it's a rather curious study because there you are. Um, it's going to be impelled to, to discover what each self exists. Each one, you're going to see what that each self exists. 
Ah. And notice that would be a great thing to do, and everybody knows how to do it. Oh, yeah. And, um, I don't even know what each self is. Yeah. And they do that until they grasp and comprehend. You're going to do that, right? You're going to keep it up. Go. Go. Until, until you grasp the nature of the good self. And then you're going to grasp the intellect itself. The self intellect. Yeah, that's what you're going to do. <laughs> And therefore, you're going to end at the end of the intelligibles. Now, the same passageway, the same progression is the dialectic. And again, he's going to go back into the image of the sun and the earth. All right, pick it up from there. You mean then indeed you have the power of the liberation from change? Mm -hmm. You want it red? Yeah. But Go ahead. It just, it just seems like that each self, the self good and the intellect, have the same relationship to each other as the I, the object of sight, and the light. That you, you grasp what each self is, the object, by self intellect, the light, and come to understand and grasp, apprehend the self good, which is the observer. So the self-good is the observer, so each look, self is the object, then, and the intellect is the light. Yeah, then the Logos is going to play the role. That's right. Uh, uh, the Logos is going to play the role of? Intellect, or light. 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 Okay, it is actually uh, to the grasp... Source, the source of it is going to be the good will, the good self, and it's going to be achieved by... Self intellect. By self intellecting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do we need a little bit more? We're getting close to understanding. We have to mess it up. No issues. All right. Um, he's now going to make a contrast. What then, says our good friend Socrates, do you not call this passage the dialectic? Certainly. Then indeed, now we need a go ahead. Uh, certainly. Then indeed you have then indeed you have the liberation from the chains and the turning about from shadows towards the images, then hey. towards the light. Hold it. He's going back to the allegory of the cave. Yep. Right? Okay, keep going. Then the ascent from earth towards the sun. Again, as, as there, on the one hand, one is unable to look directly at animals and plants and the light of the sun. On the other hand, here you have the contemplation of divine apparitions in water and the shadows of real beings, but not but not the shadows of images cast by another similar image, like in the flames, source of light. Then compared to the sun, <coughs> when compared to the sun, okay, so we're, he went back down, now we're coming back up. The whole, self pursu the whole self pursuit of the art, which we have described, also possesses the power, this power, to lead back again that which is best in soul to the contemplation of that which is best in real beings, just as in the former case, that which was brightest in the body, the eyes, is led, is led to that which is most brilliant in the corporeal and visible place. Now, obviously, it's very clear. <laughs> All right, look at it. He went back to this. He went back to the allegory of the cave. He's now making the allegory of the cave as central to understand in terms of UJ and the logos for the pursuit of the self. Notice what he's doing. We have to unpack it. Now he focuses on 
the, sec the second level in the allegory of the cave, remember? They get out of the cave and then they encounter the upper world. And then they have this experience which is an imitation of the shadows on the wall of the cave. They're now shadows on shiny objects such as lakes and watery substances. Similar dynamic is going on below as it is above. Same dynamic. So the shadows of the real of the real are going to be the very thing we've been talking about. Right here. Hmm. Huh? The intimation of that is going to be coming down. Good. So we do it, right? Wait. The liberation, right? Then you've had the liberation from the chains, the turning about from the shadows towards the images, then towards the light and the ascent from the earth towards the sun. And on the other hand, one is unable to look directly at animals and plants and the light of the sun on the one hand. There you have the contemplation of divine apparitions in water, the shadows of real beings, but not the shadow of images by some other image, but rather when compared to the sun, the whole self pursues of these arts which we've described, it has this power to lead back again to the best in the soul. Hey, the con contemplation of that is the best of real beings. So, hey, you know what? See, you now have to see that these can be ordered. They can be in a hierarchy. Right? So you have to then see these <coughs> as a hierarchy, right? They have to be arranged in a hierarchy. And that is easy to do, since one set is primarily inferred from another. Right. Going back now, we've got the dialectic. Um, we need to go further in order to clean it up. So let's do it. Um, I'm now going into again the self passage, uh, which is at 532E5. Uh, the way of the power of the dialectic. And by what ideas it's divided. And in turn, what are its paths for these that likely should conduct us to the self? Hey, what does that mean? See? By the power of the dialectics, we're going to discover by what ideas they're divided, see? We've done it. We've divided these ideas. We've divided them. Ah, once you divide them, right, you divide them, then you have to arrange them hierarchically. And that should conduct us to the self. And when we re get to that place, it's the resting place from the journey. Right? Now he's going to talk about the self-truth. Okay. Socrates then said, you will not as yet, my uh, friend Glaucon, be able to follow any further Hey, this is the limit. Of, he sees it's the limit of Glaucon's understanding. What? Well, we want to know what's beyond his understanding. He seems to be struggling to reach this point. Well, here's the block. Right. We need a reader. Who'd like to play? Yeah, good. <laughs> You will not, as yet, our friend Glaucon, be able to follow any further. 
Though for my part, no lack of goodwill shall indeed be wanting, nor would you still see the image of which we speak, but the self-truth, which thus indeed comes to light for me. If then this is so in reality or not, it is no longer worth being confidently affirmed. But it must be confidently affirmed that what we should see is surely something like that. Do you agree? Uh, what did you just come to? <coughs> something like that. Look here, he, he, can't, he has uh, Glock and you're not going to be able to follow this. What is it he's not going to be able to follow? Mm -hmm. Seeing the, the truth rather than the image. Yeah, th what did you call it? The self truth. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Hey, that's rather curious, you see, because in all of these, isn't it curious we left out truth? Mm. Hmm. Well, we put it in, but wait a minute. That's the very thing. Glaucon can't deal with. Right? Hmm. Okay. Hmm. What he calls self truth. Right? Because that's going to be, that's going to be the highest member. Hmm. So let's see what he's talking about, right? Hmm. This Glaucon's not going to be able to reach it. Is it not also the case then that it is the power of a dialectics alone? Uh, that is the power of dialectics alone, which can reveal this. Ah, and this is this. <coughs> Only the power of dialectic can reveal this. Yeah, sure. And by no other power. Now, you have to be a reader to say, what evidence do we have in the dialogue that Glaucon is stuck and he recognizes mm -hmm. that he's stuck on some key point or a key process or a key argument? Right. Look here, the last paragraph, chapter 6. <clears throat> right? There it is. Socrates tells him, hey, you're not following me. Let's take a look at the block that Glaucon has. Sir. Just a quick question here. Um, you said this is the self-truth. This but, is part uh, To reveal this? Yes. But this is, you know, Feynman, or coming from Feyna, right? Uh, light, bring to light. But the this is, uh, the, the this is missing. Of course, I'm not a Greek person, but I, my, here's my question. Um, is this sentence referring only, is it referring to the self-truth, or is it only referring to uh, uh, the point at which we have gotten to only so far, but not the self truth. No. It's literally what he's saying. So, so dialectics can get you to not only as far as we've gotten, but even further to the self truth. That's fine. Or. If you understand the dialectic, then you know why it must follow that only the dialectic can reveal the nature of truth and the truth self. That's right. And we're not talking about truth on the level of being, but truth on the no. level of the self-truth. No. The reason it's not on the level of being follows a certain logic or a dialectic. And that is, would you agree we can talk about the truth of this and that? Yeah. Right. That's how we apply it. 
So whenever you're talking about the truth of something, I mean, you know you're not talking about truth. You're talking about the quality of truth can be assigned to this or that. Yes. Therefore, if there is truth, it has to stand solely by itself and be itself and not in reference to anything else. Well, when I said truth on the level of being, that's what I was referring to. No. The quality. No. The truth, as in. No. Again, we can say this is this is true. Right. So that means we can say this has the quality of truth. It's not true. Truth must stand apart from it. Uh, everything is painted in a, in a room blue. You don't find blue. Find the color blue. Well, yeah, no, but I, I understand, but I'm, no. I'm probably missing something obvious here, but say in that line that you just mm -hmm. ran your hand across, we've got beauty, we've got justice, brilliant light of being. I would put truth in there just with the others as as an equivalent term for that, for... Well, essentially you're saying the same thing. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, so I have to answer the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, but when he's talking self-truth, is he talking about a di the dia negativa? No. Oh. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. A kind of dia negativa. But that's another story. Well, so that's... So what's... Right. So what's being referred to... Here is is second hypothesis self. Like if the second hypothesis can be said to be true, then truth is not in the second hypothesis. Right. -o. <laughs> okay. Go back. I have a question, which is when you that same rectangle. Rec rectangle you were gesturing to, did you call that the shaft, the, the, the same just the same area that has logos, brilliant light of being, beauty and justice, that area, you following me so far? You, at Earlier as you began this session you called that, you gestured to that same thing and called it shadows of real being, yeah. yes. is that what those are? Logos, brilliant light of being, beauty and justice are shadows of real being. Well, it was when we were doing the upward journey from the... the um, these, uh, these are inferred from an experience. And therefore they are not something within itself. And therefore, they're shadows of real being. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. See, now we're making distinctions we didn't make before. Mm -hmm. We're making divisions, we're finding something common in them. Yeah. Would the shadows of real beings be the objects of the studies that we just went through? They should be. Well, yes. Uh, That's right. If we can get down to them. Yeah. Because that's, that the study should awaken, should awaken the logos, and awaken Usia, so that the intellect then can proceed to discover these things. Look more directly. Until they are, they are only shadows. Hmm. Okay, we're into it now. Look, got a couple of more fun things to get to. Um, hmm. So these only turn you towards real being. They don't actually, they are not real being. Uh, logos, brilliant light of being, beauty, and I thought that was what you just agreed to. Well, forget what, forget well, what, um, da uh, David asked whether these are the objects of the studies. Yes. And so when he said that, I recalled that most of them say that they allow you to turn towards the realm of real being, That's right. such language. That's right. So that led me to ask, say then, they are not themselves, in the same way. They are the shadows, they are inferred, they are not That's real right. being. Okay, That's right. gotcha. That's right. And okay. therefore they're not true. Yes? Good.
All right, look here. This is not also the case. Here we are. That it is the power of dialectics alone which can reveal this to one who is truly skilled in experience in the studies that we've discussed in detail. That's worth affirming. Socrates, come back. All right, here we go. Go right ahead. <laughs> At least no one will dispute with us the following point. That the dialectical method is another or different study which attempts to grasp or comprehend what each being is in regards to all cases of being, in each instance of self, in an orderly way. Since on the one hand all the all the other since on the one hand all the other arts are concerned either with the opinions and desires of men or with generation and composition or with the care of everything that grows and has been compounded. While on the other hand the remaining ones who we say who we said have a grasp while on the other hand, the remaining ones whom we said had a grasp to some degree of the being, such as geometry and such as a, and such as accompany this study, on the on the one hand we see as if dreaming about being. But on the other hand, it is impossible for selves to have or behold a true waking vision so long as they leave these hypotheses they use undisturbed, unmoved, untouched without being able to give or impart logos of self. For where the beginning is that which is unknown for where the beginning or source is that which is unknown, then the conclusion and intermediate steps are connected from that which is unknown. Then by what contrivance can an agreement of such a kind ever become knowledge? <laughs> Let's uh, read. <laughs> Isn't that an injunction that however... Go ahead. Would you agree what he just said is there's a necessity that one must reveal the false hypotheses that one is holding mm -hmm. in order to truly come to the logos of the self. Notice that he's spoken quite a bit about the role of hypotheses at this point, and he's outlined what he means by a hypothesis. Oh no! No? No. Oh, well, that's just a slight omission. <laughs> okay, I want to know more about this, so we can, need to go further. Can, Pierre, can I ask one more question? Which is, <clears throat> I think we meant to, you meant to take us back to the end of. Book six, in order to see the block yes. that Glaucon had. Did mm -hmm. we go back there? No. I think we got distracted by other questions, no. No, which no. doesn't mean we can't do it. But it's good to go back to it. I thought it would be obvious, but let's do it okay. right now. So are we? Okay. Uh, so we Last Bye. couple of paragraphs, book six, Glaucon's weakness. Is this where he says, um, on the one hand, I understand, but not sufficiently? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want that read? Sure. Okay. Uh, it's, um, so, Julie, go ahead. 511C. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just below that. 
11C, end of book six, about three lines down, 511C, from C3. Okay, on the one hand, are we good? I understand, but not sufficiently, for you seem to me to speak of a massive work. However, you wish to determine that by contemplating being and the intelligible by the knowledge of dialectics is more clear than the discoveries made by the so-called arts, which, are, which use, on the one hand, hypotheses as their beginnings, and that those who theorize selves are compelled to see, to contemplate with their understanding, but not with their senses. But on the other hand, because they do not consider returning to the beginning, but begin from hypotheses, they appear to thee not to possess intellect in relation to selves, although they are intelligible when considered in conjunction with the beginning. Then you appear to me to call the disposition of the geometers and that of their like understanding, but not intellect, by having the understanding subsist somewhere between opinion and intellect. Mm -hmm. And then Socrates right. suggests he right. works out. Okay, you have taken my meaning most sufficiently, and now take me to mean that corresponding to the four sections, there exist these four experiences uh, in the soul. Intellection, answering to the highest section, then understanding to the second section, then assign trusting to the third section, and image thinking to the last section, and arrange selves analogously, being led to believe that just as the experience says, the experiences which they represent participate of the truth, so also did they participate of clarity. I understand and I concur and I arrange them as you say. What does that show? A block that he, uh, an insufficient understanding That's or wrong. vision. So that allows us to see that he will be blocked on some subject, and Socrates is pointing out when you're going to the idea of truth, this is going to go beyond you. Right? Mm -hmm. Good. Right. Um, now we're back to the dialectical method. Please, go on. This is uh, yeah, try it over again. 533C8. Thank you. Uh, is it not the case then that the dialectical method journeys in this way alone to the source of self by taking up the hypotheses in order that it may firmly establish them and by gently drawing and leading upwards the eye of the soul, which was in reality buried in a certain barbaric bog. By using those arts we have described in detail as handmaidens and assistants in conversion, which on the one hand, through custom, we frequently call forms of knowledge, but on the other hand, they require another designation uh, that is on the one hand more clear than opinion but on the other hand more obscure than knowledge. But somewhere in the preceding logos we have indeed defined self as the power of the understanding. Whereas the dispute is not as it appears to me about a name when matters of such importance, when matters of, whereas the dispute is not as it appears to me about a name, when matters of such import lie before us for examination. It's indeed not, but it is about that which dialectics will slow, solely reveal, mm -hmm. the clarity of vision that will assist, lead us out, which is said to exist in soul. Hmm. So look here. It's a great line. Um, the dialectical method, therefore, 
proceeds in this way to the source of the self, right? Right? How is it going to do it? Take a look. See? By taking up or raising the hypothesis in order that it may be firmly established in them. It has to be established in the hypotheses. Right? I get to establish in the hypothesis. That's the only way you can do this. Right? Uh, and then, what will happen? As a result of that, it may be firmly be established and gently drawing upwards, leading upwards the eye of the soul, which is up to this time been buried in a barbaric hole, right? So... Uh, For those of you who appreciate great art, there's a picture of the soul in the eye of the soul. Yes. All right. Always good. Right. I have a question though. Pierre, right where it says source of self, that that actually is like self source. Arcane outane is self source or source Origin. self. It's not of self, because that's gonna take you, it seems to me, to another direction, suggesting that self has a source, unless it means it's, but in any case, the Greek literally is self-source, or something along that line. The well, source, wait a minute, and the positive? Wait a minute, yeah, I, you're looking also at RK. Right, that's what I mean, he's yeah. using R, it could be principle, but no, I was just saying, Dave, it's not of. I know, so the source, comma, the self. That's an apothecary. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, Works up here. Works or the beginning, or the rule, or the... Especially if I don't have another... Uh, principle. Mm. Principle. Principle might be... Yeah. Mm. Uh, alone, we'll, you'll be able to seek out the principle of the self, or the beginning of the self, or any other word you want. Mm. That's a nice choice. It uh, echoes back to the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, right? Mm -hmm. Ain't okay, ain't a logos, right? Arche, in the mm -hmm. beginning, could be in principle of the Word. Right? And this is, a, this is also in opposition to the criticism of Glaucon, right? Or the block of Gra the mm -hmm. Glaucon, because he didn't take it up with that. That's true. Good, good, good. And uh, notice he's... Uh, established in the hypothesis. Now, what's most interesting about that, I'm sure you recognize it, is this curious S. Mm, hypotheses. Uh, yep. Plural. He must be, he must have an idea of a bunch of hypotheses, must he not? Yeah. And that's why he details them so carefully in the mm. Republic. <laughs> or does he? No. Mm. Okay, we'll, we'll, we're still on the trail. <laughs> um. Okay, we're back into opinion and making that contrast. Let's go with our reading. Keep you left, you left off, sir. Okay, uh, 534. Uh, is it sufficient then, on the one hand, to call the first part knowledge, just as we did formerly, and on the other hand, the second part, the power of understanding, then the third, trust, and the fourth, image thinking? Furthermore, on the one hand, both of these correspond to opinion, while on the other hand, both of those correspond to intellection. 
And on the one hand, that opinion is employed about generation. Whereas on the other hand, intellection is employed about usia. Likewise, whatever relation usia has to generation, so also does intellection have to opinion. And whatever relation intellection has to opinion, so also does knowledge to trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. uh, that's worth belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. And the power of understanding to image thinking. You say that's worth belief? Look. Yeah. Please look here. Trust all the way through. Do you remember the divided line in book six? Mm -hmm. What did he just do? Hmm. No. Yeah, go over it again. Watch. Um. Is it sufficient then, on the one hand, to call the first part knowledge, just as we did formally, and on the other hand, the second part, the power of understanding? Uh, right. Follows the same logic of the divided line in book six. Go ahead. Then the third, trust. That's belief. And the fourth, image thinking. Image thinking. Right. There they are, the four, right out of book six. Go ahead. Furthermore, on the one hand, both of these correspond to opinion, while on the other hand, both of, both of those correspond to intellection. Ah, oh, uh, intellection is going to call one intellection one a book, say. Go ahead. And on the one hand, that opinion is employed about generation, whereas on the other hand, intellection is employed, employed about Lucia. See, he's now reflecting on six and adding to it. Read that line again. Why? Yeah. On the one hand, that opinion is employed about generation. Whereas on the other hand, intellection is employed about Lucia. This is the realm of intellect. <coughs> and therefore it deals with that power of the mind to turn upon itself called Lucia. He's adding this. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Likewise, whatever relation Usia has to generation, so also does intellect, intellection have to opinion. There you got it. What do you think of that analogy? Yeah. Well, first of all, kudos for translating Lucia as Lucia. Um, <laughs> but, but secondly, uh, if it's being compared with generation, generation has the idea of growth and coming to completion. And thus, in the world of Lucia, Lucia also would have the idea of upwards turning growth and fulfillment. And nice. growth and development. Yes, go ahead. That's it. Yeah, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Could you say it again? Well, um, that uh, he's comparing many things um, in the higher and lower. Uh, in the world of uh, the world of opinion, generation is the driving factor, and in the world of uh, intellection, who see it is the driving factor. Factor, and if you look at generation, generation is supposed to lead to growth and completion. Thus, we can uh, conclude something about Usia, that its job is to have growth and, and completion. Right, to carry those mo those ideas back to Usia to complete the analogy. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. All right, look. Um, what do we want to do? Right, we want to look at this again. Mm -hmm. The goal is to comprehend what each being is. And in all cases, indeed, each instance of self. Right? So we're back to this, have to make divisions in uh, the realm of reality or the uh, realm of uh, the intelligible. And you have to do something similar about the self. See? Wow. Again and again, he's going to make that as a key element. 
because you want to know each instance of self. Hey, on the intelligible level, what's a, what are the members in that self? Right? You have to distinguish the each self, each individual self. Then you also have to do the same thing in the realm of reality or the remote realm of see, uh, pardon me, the realm of the intelligible or brilliant might have been. Divisions, divisions, divisions on two levels. Ah, good. Um, now, um, um, we have to get to uh, a little bit more. Okay, we were on 533, sir? Um, Your left on that? Just above 534b. But let us leave alone. <coughs> but let us leave alone, O Glaucon, the analogy of objects to which these powers correspond, and the twofold division of each, such as of the object of opinion and the object of intellection, in order that we may not strike up many more discussions than those that went before. Really? Go ahead. We're going to go one more, two, two more steps. Uh, I have a, a weird section here. I think everybody has it. You mean whereas for the sake of clarity? Yeah. And I'll just read it. I'll just read it. No, this is a key point. Go ahead. Whereas for the sake of clarity, and since we will take the time to descend, let us take up the analogy concerning these powers and their objects. According to doctors of philosophy, uh, Pierre Grimes and Regina Uliana, hmm? uh, <laughs> listen to what? This is a, a footnote uh, mm. where? that Juan is adding. So where do we go back to? Go back to where you see the Greek. Oh, true. I don't see yeah. for a while. I don't see Which is two pages. Not that we wouldn't want to find out what Juan thinks, but well, I'll kind of talk wow. page 320. There you go. Yeah, that's, yeah, in my book, that's actually three pages. Okay. No, two pages. So, two full pages. Two. Top of 320. Mm. Yeah. Talk of 320. Top mm. of 320. Yeah. Okay. Glaucon, certainly then, as far as these other analogies are concerned, I agree, as far as I'm able to follow. Mm. Mm. Uh, would you call a dialectician the person who comprehends the logos pertaining to the usia of each being? And as for the person who has no such comprehension, insofar as they are unable to give an account to self and also to another person, then according to such inability, will you not say that they possess intellectual insight about these beings? Hold How it. could I say hold so? Hold it, hold it, hold it. Do that again. Key phrase. Uh, would you also call a dialectician the person who comprehends the logos pertaining to the usia of each being? Right. Wow. Then each being has. Usia <coughs> and logos. And an Usia. And an Usia. Hey, isn't that curious? Look what he's doing. Uh, uh, the person who comprehends the logos. Right? pertaining to the usia of each being, then each being, now we got to go back, see, to each being, and we have to assign to each one of these beings the, a curious factor. Right? Good heavens. We're going to have to assign to each of these
to share. That is, each one of those must have the power of turning upon itself. Therefore, it has to be alive and intelligible and active. He's putting a see in each one of the major ideas of being. Well, he needed that because it's not just an idea. Good. All right? We need that. Okay. Now, please proceed. And as for the person who has no such comprehension, insofar as they are unable to give an account to self and also to another person, then according to such inability, will you not say that they possess intellectual insight about these beings? How could they without that? Yeah, and that's also unable to give a logos to self. That's right. <coughs> that's right. Go ahead, here we go. Is it not the case... Is it not also the case, in the same way concerning the good? Whosoever cannot define the limits by the logos, by selecting the idea of the good above all others, and just as in battle, by piercing through all refutations, eagerly striving to determine everything, not according to opinion, but according to a seer, in all these cases, traversing through them with the unfailing logos, such a person, you will say, knows neither the good self nor has a hold of anything good whatsoever. But if they have got a hold in some way of a certain image of the good, then they have gotten a hold of it by opinion, but not by knowledge. And in the present life they are asleep and dreaming, and before they are awakened they will descend to Hades. Until there, they are finally laid to deep sleep. Yes, by Zeus, I emphatically declare all these things indeed. Okay, that's it. Now, take a minute out and tell me what he just said. It's in the first sentence. What's the logos? How is it functioning? What is its limitation? You have to be able to define the limit by the logos. Right? By the logos, you have to define the limit. Right? Because there's a logos to define the limit. By selecting the idea of good above all others. That's what you've got to do. And you've got to hold on, according to Usia, reflection. In all these cases, right? with an unfailing logos, to know the self good. Hmm. Take a look. And if you can't do that with the logos, you got nothing. Look here. You have to define the limit using the logos by selecting the idea of the good above all others. According to the Usia, an unfailing logos, you have to be able to do that. What do you have to do? All right, take a minute. What's a refutation? It's what they talk about as being the nature of Socratic dialogue. A disproof? All contrary arguments? Right. That whoever, whoever cannot define the limit by the logos by selecting the idea of the good above all others. Uh, 
really serious sentence, and you may have to look at it more than that. Well, yeah. you have to read through all the negatives. They have to be able to do everything that person can. That's the goal mm -hmm. with the logo. And notice he made it very clear to us what he means by the logo. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no. Right? Now look here. We're leaving out one more study. Right? There's one more study good, that has good. to tap them all. Good. Better help us. The apprehension of the good. Yeah. He doesn't do that. Dream, book nine. Hmm. That's the study where then to have a personal knowledge of the self. So let's get there the last, the uh, early part of book nine. Whoa, dreams. Now, just a uh, we'll correct this later tonight. But we didn't study the dialectic in book six, right? There's a different view of the dialectic in book six and book seven, and we have to go back over that before we go much further. But right now, let's take a look at dreams. Book nine, early part of book nine. I don't. It just starts with one. Five, seven, oh, thank you. Just what I need. So you're talking about 571C? Um, or 572, yeah. 572. Um, yeah, 571E5 or... E. Yeah, yeah, somewhere like that. <laughs> Whereas I suspect that when self, Rada Carver? Sure. Can I read it? Any, sure. Thank you. Whereas I suspect that when self is indeed kept in a healthy and sound minded way by self, and on the one hand, when it goes to sleep after having awakened the rational part of themselves, and after having feasted it with beautiful reasonings, logo, and good inquiries, self attains to self in meditation, while on the other hand, the appetitive part is neither bound in need nor filled full, so that it may be lulled to sleep, and in order that it does not disturb the best part of the soul with either its joy or grief, but allows self to search by self, singularly pure, and by this yearning to also apprehend that which she does not know, such as either something of those that have come to be in the past or of those that now exist. And that's interesting, that's on tone. Or again, of those that will exist. Hmm. And so in the same way, by having calmed the spirited part of the soul, by not allowing it to be angry about anything, nor to lay down to sleep while being passionately agitated, then, on the one hand, by having quieted these two species of the soul, while on the other hand, having bestirred the third part of the soul in which mindfulness resides, in this way, the soul may take her rest. And you know that the truth is especially touched or apprehended in such an aspect. And thus, the visual manifestations of her dreams are least likely to be lawless. Hmm. Shall I go further? Where's the part about? No, that's good. Okay. Um. Hmm. The truth is especially apprehended. Yeah, thank you. That's where we're going. What do you say? And the word truth. How is the idea of truth being used? 
Hold it. Bill? Can she read that again? We don't have a copy of that. Uh, Pardon? Okay, Ralph. We have Ralph. We don't have the. Oh, no. Ralph's it's not there. That's what I mean. Yeah, read that again. How about the load? Here. I have a load that you guys can use. We have a load here. We have a load. Oh, okay. It's 571, uh, 571, just above E, 571D. I'll use that. But they want to secure the idea. I thought they wanted me to read it all again. Yeah, they did. Do you guys still want me to read it all again? No. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, Whereas I suspect that when self is indeed kept in a healthy and sound-minded way by self, and on the one hand when it goes to sleep, after having awakened the rational part of themselves, and after having feasted it with beautiful reasonings and good inquiries, self attains to meditation. While on the other hand, the appetitive part is neither bound in need nor filled full, so that it may be lulled to sleep and in order that it does not disturb the best part of the soul with either its joy or grief, but allows self to search by self, singularly pure, and by this yearning to also apprehend that which she does not know, such as either something of those that have come to be in the past, or of those that uh, now exist, or again of those that will exist, and so, in the same way, by having calmed the spirited part of the soul, by not allowing it to be angry about anything, nor to lay down to sleep while being passionately agitated, then, on the one hand, by having quieted these two species of the soul, while on the other hand, having bestirred the third part of the soul, in which mindfulness resides, in this way, the soul may take her rest. And you know that, the truth is especially touched or grasped in such an aspect, and thus the visual manifestation of her dreams are least likely to be lawless. Wow. So that's where you can touch truth. What do you make of that? That, you know, like... Um, it's just kind of interesting that things that have come to be in the past, and then the middle part, the translation yeah. reads that now exists. And there isn't a word for now there. And there is the word for beings. Yeah. Okay. So it allows for two readings, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Go ahead. Either of the things that are now in one's life, like we take dreams, or of the higher level the of higher being level realities. Being or reality. Yeah? yeah, and that fits well with both, kind of. Yeah, and we would prefer the higher reality. We would. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. Say, um, how is he using the idea of truth? Remember we had that puzzle a short while ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. How is he using it? Hmm. He won't add to it? He won't expand it. Oh, true. He lays it down. <laughs> That's what that is true. But he has told us in book six where truth is born to us in an experience of the idea of the good, that that's where truth... Get the quote for us? I'll tell you what. Time to take a break. <laughs> Time to take a break. And we'll return to Julie's quote when we come back. Excellent. All right? Okay. Thank you. Such a pure quote. So Thank you. Such a pure quote. Such a pure quote.